So this is the slide that we left off with. I went through a couple of other slides out of order. Um, so I'll just go over this slide briefly again and then go through the slides in order to the end that we didn't get to uh, in the presentation on the brain and grief during COVID. So this is from the work of Jack Panksepp, who developed the field of effective neuroscience, the um, foundations of human and animal emotions. So we were looking at the fear circuit and then the panic grief circuit. So here we're looking at anxiety, the panic grief circuit, and also very much uh, distress, um, uh, separation distress system. So uh, he finds this uh, very much akin to grief, how we feel when we are separated from our beloved. So um, how they discovered this circuit with the effect of neuroscience was with distress vocalizations with little mammals. So they are seeking reunion, this little guy here, seeking reunion with the mother. Here she is down here. And it's the social bonding that is so important. So the um, distress is aroused um, in the parent uh, and then the caretaking system is aroused in the parent. So when they hear the distress call, they get distressed. And in order to quell that, and of course, take care of their young, they touch them, hold them, feed them, whatever's called for in the moment. So this touch and contact quells and settles down this distress, this panic. And interestingly enough, Demir Del Monte teaches us that touch is the first sense to develop in utero. So that tells us that it's pretty important and pretty sophisticated. So of course we know with our, our human babies, we have here the gaze with the mother, of course, as well as the touch. Um, and thinking of, of how uh, mothers will be so distressed when their baby is crying and just do anything that they can to help to quiet them down. Funny little voices and songs and little rocking back and forth. Um, and so this is part of our mammalian brain, our limbic system. And next, uh, we didn't really look at this slide before. So this will kind of start the new slides. So with the panic and care system, uh, we have our social interaction. So this is how our species as human beings was able to uh, make it to today. If we had not cared for each other, uh, children need a long period of time in which to be taken care of by parents. Uh, that's called altricial um, and precocial are the animals and mammals that will have, um, when the baby is born, they stand up right away and they're ready to ambulate like um, a horse, uh, a, a cow, a deer. Pretty quickly, they're able to get up on their feet and follow the mother. Even though they still need care, they're up and moving independently. So um, again, now looking at the um, uh, panic and the separation distress, in evolutionary terms, psychic pain or emotional pain emerged from brain emotional systems in the mammalian line to inform individuals of the nature of their social environments to help to create social bonds. Again, we need each other. When you think our little thin skin and our tiny little teeth and nails compared to an animal with a hide or fur and they may have you know big fangs and claws when you think of us uh, in an environment where there are animals like this and the weather and the climate if we had not bonded together we would never have survived as such a um, very fragile bipedal you know two-footed creature so um, when the panic circuit is aroused, um, we find this with young animals being separated from their social support system. So this is what Jack Panksepp studied. 
and they measured this by monitoring their separation calls that the young animals would cry out um, when they're left alone in strange new places or if the mother's been gone too long. So these they call separation distress vocalizations or DVs. So these distress vocalizations, these DVs are one of the most primitive forms of audio vocal communications and it underlies brain mechanisms in all mammals. So what's interesting is the specific brain area is the inferior colliculi in the midbrain. We looked at the superior colliculus in, um, in our other slides. So here it's the bottom, the red is that in the midbrain where these calls um, originate from or, or this part of the brain um, is very much involved in um, creating these distress vocalizations. And interesting that the superior colliculus is right here above it. So the arousability of this system um, is very much related to reptilian place attachments. So reptiles are cold-blooded and they need to know where to find warmth and of course where to find food and water and shelter and so this is a very basic need of place the right place to be able to survive so the place of the young with their parent is imperative so when we think of people with developmental trauma with very difficult childhoods. And then you put um, this era of COVID. And for those of us that uh, feel we had a, you know, the, the good enough childhood or a very good childhood, whatever, nothing's ever perfect. But the challenges and the kind of separation we have from people in our professional life, certainly in our family life with, with our friends, but also with our colleagues and with our work um, can make us feel very distressed at a very primal foundational level. And when you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, place is one of the first along with the absolute basics of life, food, shelter, and a place to be. So this neural nature of um, the separation distress calls um, and social attachment systems. I can't see it here on the slide, so I'm looking at my little, you'll be getting this, the handout. Um, it's closely related evolutionarily and neurochemically to the systems of love and nurturance. Again, the care circuit, just underlining that, that this grief, separation, and care very much uh, intertwined. Those we care about and love, we're going to feel worse about when they are gone or if something is not right with them. It, our system gets very uh, stirred up, distressed, upset, worried, whatever, because we care so deeply. So these different primal emotions, of course, interdigitate with each other. And here we see this little bird um, even though not a mammal, birds are highly intelligent. And this little bird was taken in the lab from its mother. And even the hands of one of the researchers around the baby bird made him quiet down or her quiet down. And so the proximity of the caretaker can decrease these distress vocalizations, the DVs. It's the separation and reunion. And when you think of the great stories um, in our, our culture and in history, movies, um, so much about separation and then reunion. And so much of the story, um, the book or the movie will be about, are they going to get together? Or are they going to find each other? Or is this one gonna find their way back home? Um, the separation and reunion is at our very core of what us, makes us feel safe and secure. So, you know, obviously all along the way, growing up and into our adult years. And then when something happens like COVID, we are shaken at our core. And in some ways with this, 
with COVID to be reunited with life as we knew it. The grieving that is going on around my life the way it was for us here in New York and New Jersey on the East Coast in the US around, you know, beginning to mid-March is when we started to shut down and shelter in place. And so thinking of life in February or January last year, um, our life pretty much as, as we knew it, this is a huge change. So, and then this is kind of an interesting piece that the um, distress vocalizations, Jack Panksepp theorizes that possibly this is the roots of depression. So with the young, we have the little young bear here without his mama, and he's starting to look pretty upset or, or low, low. And as time passes with no return of the parent, this despair response, depression sets in, and the survival functions of it are that predators are no longer, sig no longer signaled by the continual distress vocalizations. And there's a conservation of energy on the part of the little bear because he's not crying out and calling or she isn't anymore. So hopefully this little one stays alive in hopes of the parental reunion. Maybe the mama comes back with uh, some food to eat or leads him to where there's water, who knows. But um, it's a very interesting thought that this uh, time passing and the important parent figure doesn't return, that the system goes into a kind of collapse if these, the crying, the crying out lasts for quite a period of time. So it makes me think of the babies that in the 1950s, we had a doctor called, um, doctor, was it Dr. Spock? Um, because I'm thinking of the character of Mr. Spock on Star Trek. And Dr. Spock was very different than that. Dr. Spock talked about letting children cry it out, and not children, babies, that they babies would just cry themselves into a little puddle of this, like this little bear that Jack Panksepp is saying possibly are the roots of depression. So um, again, this era of COVID can reawaken for people um, a lot of this attachment um, world and experience and feeling. Um, so, um, uh, with this persistent isolation, going a little deeper with this, uh, we can get an over responsiveness of that HPA system. Remember that hypothalamus to pituitary to adrenal glands that then pump out cortisol when the threat has been assessed as great enough, uh, life-threatening. So um, then the little one just stops those calls and those cries and the despair and the depression, dep uh, depression following long-term loss and separation. Um, so here's one of the little monkey babies from the Harlow monkey studies of the 1950s. They were taken away from the mother and given a wire mother with some milk or some food or this cloth mother. They preferred the cloth mother. So how much the comfort and the closeness and the softness is desired and it's just heartbreaking what they did with these little monkeys. Anyways, um, so this um, uh, deep psychic pain, deep emotional pain and distress that we feel certainly with being separated evolved from more primitive distress mechanisms, and they are the ones that mediate pain and coldness. There's, so there's a particular um, tract that goes from uh, the part of the body that would be cold or in pain all the way up through the spine, all the way up through the brain stem to a place in the thalamus, and then synapses on particular areas 
in the sensory cortex, the area that would correspond to the foot, to the face, to the hand, whatever is experiencing the, the pain of the cold, of the, um, or the temperature, the heat or the cold, or the, the pain, something, uh, whether a, a cut or a, a, a bruise, an injury. So the different names for this are the spinothalamic tract, and we do have that article in our brain spotting um, manual. Uh, I believe it's in phase two that it, uh, Frank Corrigan, who had talked about first recruiting the midbrain circuits and looking at the superior colliculus in that midbrain that we have that bookmark that um, is going from the retina to the superior colliculus in the brainstem and then directly back to the visual cortex where other visual streams um, take a another route going through the thalamus so that superior colliculus is the quick fast track so this is a very old tract and he talks about this in his next article with what he thinks is going on with brain spotting this is also called the anterolateral pathway or the pain and temperature pathway so when you see these names you know that these have to do with pain and temperature and that our emotional system that feels that pain and that distress of being separated evolved out of this line, this pathway. It evolved from this. So I didn't get to these slides. So this is um, from Demir's uh, two-day seminar that he has every year in December. Um, the most recent one was the second one on uh, the brain, uh, neurobiology, and attachment. So, of course, looking at all this grief, the brain during the era of COVID, trauma, attachment, PTSD, dissociation, all of these um, uh, uh, have such an impact in the COVID era. Of course, they have an impact when there's not COVID. But any traumas, David says, any trauma we have wakes up other traumas going back to the original trauma. Our attachment system, whether we have that, that good secure attachment or an insecure attachment or disorganized attachment, um, um, this will come to play very much in our shelter in place uh, and are not going to work. These issues from way back can be touched upon for people. So just considering with your different clients what is emerging in, in them as we're going through more months of being um, uh, away from other people, for the most part, away from large groups. There's some opening up now, at least here in the US, um, but not what it was prior. And of course, PTSD. Anybody who has experienced this or is experiencing it now, um, that things are waking up from past traumas um, is going to be affected. And of course, dissociation, where David is talking about that we're going back and forth between these different um, states of being the survival defensive programs that we talked about earlier in this discussion. Um, so dissociation really being a big one, that something that is constantly now still around and we have a lot of uncertainty about and brain spotting is so much about the uncertainty principle, um, it just can get to be too much um, what we're going through and learning about COVID and who can we say, see and how are we safe and can we go back to our offices and how are we working um, with telehealth on screen, how many hours a day, that we just either need some distraction or we just ourselves dissociate and just sort of go somewhere for a while. That it's to be expected to not be hard on ourselves and to teach our clients that this, you know, if this happens for them, just, you know, not to worry about themselves, that it's very normal in this very challenging period of time to normalize a lot of what they're going through. 
And uh, David talks about developmental trauma can really be hardwired throughout the brain, different than when he talks about the trauma capsules that may be for someone that, again, had that good enough upbringing where they felt mostly safe and secure, but you know, they go through um, a terrible trauma of some kind, a very bad car accident, or were involved in 9-11, or a, a, one of your, your earthquakes that you had in Indonesia, that, um, that it's more that trauma capsule, it's a neural network that when something in the environment has a piece of what was experienced at the time of the trauma, it can wake it up and then there's um, the PTSD sort of reaction that's going on. But with developmental trauma, when it's before age three, the only memory that that little child has is implicit unconscious memory that we were talking about before, made by the amygdala, the assessor of, is it safe and warm? Is it okay? Am I not sure? Is it life-threatening? Um, and the um, uh, hippocampus coming online later, around age three in life, um, where the explicit memory, the autobiographical remembering, oh, this happened yesterday. Oh, that was last year. And of course, when you're three, you're not gonna be remembering, oh, that was last year. But as the child is growing up, this capacity, this um, explicit memory capacity is developing. So uh, our attachment is in the limbic system. That's the mammalian brain. That's what we're looking at with Jack Panksepp's work, that foundation of human and animal emotions. And what we find is that oxytocin, that feel good chemical that uh, comes from um, when we looked at the hypothalamus, the same area that will get um, the corticotropin releasing hormone ready to signal the pituitary and then the adrenal to start cortisol that same part in the um in the hypothalamus will also produce oxytocin and oxytocin helps to boost serotonin so they like to use these fancy words right so agonist and agonist is many of you may know it i didn't before i started studying neuroscience um, it is uh, a booster, so it helps. So if you've got the oxytocin and the good serotonin levels, you've got that good feeling, that good feeling going. So this is where, again, a challenge because we can't be around maybe the people that mean the most to us. We might be able to see them on the screen. Maybe we can't be um, physically in, in touch with them, literally in touch the first sense to develop in the brain in utero, as we saw. Um, so the challenges, again, for each client, just to be thinking when we look at each of these, these different areas, what's going on for our client and how can we be most helpful and empathic and attuned to them. And um, PTSD on one end of the scale and dissociation on the other, in the limbic system and the brainstem. So um, in the brainstem are those survival programs in the PAG, periaqueductal gray, the fight, flight, freeze, faint, dissociation. So let's look now at that. So this is a Demir slide, so you won't have this in your handout, um, but I tried to put a little bit of text in there as a, a memory prompt that what we have going on with PTSD is um, not enough regulation from these areas we looked at, the agranular esocortex, those middle prefrontal circuits, which are the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the orbital frontal cortex behind the orbits of the eyes, and that anterior cingulate that's just hugging over the corpus callosum here, and here would be the eyes looking out this way. So we're not getting enough of their regulation, but we're getting too much. Um, so it's a, a emotional undermodulation. So we're getting too much from the amygdala here. And with dissociation, we're getting too much. It's an over 
regulation and overmodulation from these regulating areas to the point where it's suppressing, oppressing, and shutting down. Um, and not enough of the amygdala that we have to have some sense of, uh, you know, is this safe or not, just the appropriate amount of vigilance. So I like this, that he sets up this way. Um, he's taken this from Ruth Lanius's work in 2010, but these are his pictures here. And he does these beautiful, beautiful pictures of the brain. So the PTSD with um, not enough uh, modulation, but too much of the amygdala and dissociation with too much of these regulating areas and not enough amygdala. Um, and then in this is early stress um, here. So just for anyone growing up, in utero and then as a baby and growing up, the early stress will affect these different systems. And this is another slide from Demir. So in our endocrine system, our corticotropin releasing hormone that comes from the hypothalamus um, and the cortisol is up. And of course that has that HPA access, the adrenals then bringing on the cortisol. So that makes sense that that's up, but the oxytocin is down, which is the feel, a feel-good chemical. So that's a challenge. Um, with the immune system, inflammatory processes are up, which is not good. And then uh, neurostructural, we have the volume of the prefrontal cortex. So this would be our thinking um, uh, cognitive brain, that dorsolateral, um, prefrontal cortex here, left side, that's down, which is not good. The hippocampus down, which is not good. That's our explicit memory maker. Corpus callosum down, not good. That's where the signals will go back and forth between both sides of the brain. The amygdala up, two up, not good. Um, and the amygdala reactivity, of course, then is up. And the connectivity between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex here is down. So that's not good. We don't have the peace that our conscious brain can do with the signals. It does have that one indirect connection to the alarm system. So the best that they can be connected, we want them to be. But in the situation of early stress, not so much here. And then, uh, Mental, um, this is what can come later in life, is depression, anxiety, addictions, and um, PTSD and uh, diagnosis of uh, borderline disorder. And for somatic, oy, all these, cardiovascular diseases, COPD, which is the, um, oh, I'm not getting what each initial means, but it's a, a a lesser lung function and getting worse all the time. This one, I'm, I'm not sure what that one is. Um, this is in, um, yeah, I don't know that one. Um, and diabetes, of course, chronic pain and autoimmunological diseases. So early stress is um, a lot, of course, uh, a lot of problem. Um, for the individual. And so you've got this, if you have this situation, and here we go again, with the brain and grief and in COVID, how greatly challenged um, people can be who have had this early stress and how we work with them is so important. So for the brain spotters in the audience, I really feel to me the biggest one is gay spotting. I think I mentioned before that um, I wrote that article in uh, The Power of Brain Spotting. Um, and I really talked about using gaze spotting so that we're not interrupting too much and we're not giving um, too much for the person to think about or do because during grief, that prefrontal cortex just tends to shut 
down. We really are challenged cognitively. So where the person is naturally looking, that's the gaze spot. They're either returning to a place to look off and, or they're just kind of off there as they speak, or maybe they're not even speaking. They just have that stare. So harnessing that can be one of the greatest ways to work. And I think I spoke about before, um, I have, um, uh, for the brain spotters, again, I have a video on uh, brain spotting and telehealth. And um, I go into a little more about each of these setups in that. And there is a handout for that as well. You can email me. You can uh, private message me um, on, uh, through Facebook practitioners um, if you want more information. But I think for the brain spotters, most people are aware of using gaze spotting. And that idea of sitting with the person who is grieving, perhaps you know it's something in their own life. Maybe they've lost someone due to COVID or they've lost the person as they knew them because they're in COVID, they're on a ventilator and they can't go to see them and they don't know if they're going to live or die. Um, be, just being with that person, it can be very hard for people to just sit with someone who's going through such a terrible, traumatic time um, and not be saying too much. Let, let it come from them. Um, and I think that's where the gay spotting is so helpful and our presence is so helpful. Their limbic system is picking up ours and picking up our attunement and the way that we're listening to them and the way that we're with them. Um, so another way, of course, that you can work is the body resource. So finding where in the body they're calm, grounded, and centered. Or if they don't feel that, where they're neutral. If they don't feel that, then the less bad place, the place that doesn't feel as um, unhappy or pained or whatever the activation is, just feels better than that somehow. And having them get a, a brain spot based on the body resource. Of course, the one eye, you can see which side feels better and whether you get a spot on that or you just have them, maybe the one eye is just enough. Using the advanced body resource, um, I really think this might come more later with losses people have had because it's a lot going on that you're doing with someone. You're having them get the eye, then you're having them with the inside window get the, um, uh, the spot and you found the body resource before this and then you're seeing on the z-axis near or far which feels better everything which feels better so following all of that um, certainly when someone has just recently had a loss can be a lot for that person but i've also seen demos where someone had a loss in the past and this can happen with covid that some loss from the past is coming up now um, in such a way that um, it's difficult, but being able to work with it and work around it, having the triple resource gives them what they need to be able to go into that material. So again, just depending on the client. Of course, the access, if you are working on activation and things get too tough, you can always just have them look past the point into the distance and you can have them turn the screen. You know, if they're, I'm just turning my screen here, if they're on telehealth, that they can look out into their room. If you have been using a pointer, a lot of times people have found something when you're working telehealth in their, um, in their environment. So maybe they found something and they, they put a, found an area, but they put a little cup like on a table. And maybe then what they're doing is looking past that cup um, to get the Z access. Uh, dream spotting. This is from uh, phase four. Um, dream spotting is just simply asking the person uh, when they've spoken about the dream, we're on the back wall, we're on your wall, if we're doing telehealth, do you feel that dream? And then you just work with that spot. Again, I have all this in that handout and in that uh, brain spotting and telehealth Zoom recording. 
and then double spotting. You know, maybe maybe somebody's even on a resource spot, or maybe it's in their room, and they feel like somewhere else feels even better. Or perhaps you've been on the activation spot. So I think depending on the type of loss, on the rawness of it, um, when I think of the pain of losing someone and the early stages of grief, I think of gay spotting. So that's my thought there. Oh, and we're done now. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> of course, thank you very much. And here, here is me if you want to be in touch with me here um, at this email. You know, if you have any questions, um, you know, things that came up particularly in this portion that I'm, I'm uh, going through the slides where you weren't able to ask some questions like we did when we were in person. Um, and then here's Demir's information. Please visit his website, see all the beautiful pictures of the brain he has, and please visit the YouTube channel. He has some um, uh, two and three minute videos that he's put together that will make a 20 minute long video that he calls uh, 20 minutes um, uh, to the brain, something like that, but it's about the brain in 20 minutes, the brain in 20 minutes, that may be it. And he keeps adding sections on so you can see that. And it's very helpful to him if you can leave a comment there um, on the YouTube channel. And then of course, for those who aren't brain spotters yet, hopefully we're hoping that some of you will decide that you'd like to train with uh, Inya and Adit, if you're in Indonesia or if you've been watching from another country, that you uh, go on uh, brainspotting.com and find out where there's a training near you and um, that you join our wonderful brainspotting community. Uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful group of people all over the world um, that work with this wonderful neurobiological method that addresses where you look affects how you feel and using that visual field in order to help the brain know what it knows so well how to do under the right conditions to come to that homeostasis and restoration. We started out talking about those three, the survival, then the homeostasis, then the restoration. Uh, restoration. So the brain spotting seems to help very much for the brain to be able to come to homeostasis and to restoration um, uh, in the appropriate, of course, situation. Um, we certainly need our survival mode in our brain when that's called for, and that will always be there for us. Um, so thank you again very much, and thank you, uh, Enia and Adi. This has been a wonderful opportunity. So take good care. And I hope I'll see you all again somewhere along the way. Be well and be safe. Bye-bye.